Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Farmer. I'm a business immigration attorney. My law firm's name is Farmer Law PC. Uh, I grew up in Texas. I went to Texas A&M for undergraduate. After that, I went to Vanderbilt Law School. Uh, I, my wife and I went to law school together. We moved up to Iowa afterwards, which is where we started our law firm, helping agricultural employers uh, meet their labor shortage needs. Uh, and that's what we continue to do to this day. Thanks, Kyle. Hi, I'm Leon Sequera. Uh, I'm an attorney representing employers of guest workers, both in the H-2A and H-2B program. Uh, do a variety of work for those employers, basically everything except file application paperwork with the federal agencies. Uh, do a lot of wage and hour related uh, audits and investigations um, and any number of other problems with federal agencies. Uh, also represent clients and provide counseling and compliance advice related to public policy issues, um, pending regulations and, and legislation, including uh, what we're gonna talk about today. So the Farm Workforce Modernization Act uh, is H.R. 1603 in the current Congress. Uh, many of you may have heard of this bill before. It did pass the House in December of 2019, it was recently reintroduced by Representative Zoe Lofgren of California. She chairs the Immigration Subcommittee in the House. In 2019, her bill uh, passed by a healthy margin. Um, Virtually all Democrats voted for it, not all, but virtually all of them did, and a handful of Republicans. It's expected that this bill will again be on the floor in the House as soon as this Thursday um, under some special House rules that allow legislation from a prior, prior Congress to be um, called up and go directly to the floor to bypass the committee. So again, that could be on the floor as soon as this Thursday. So what's in the Farm Workforce Modernization Act? Well, um, the bill is structured into three different titles. Uh, the first title contains a legalization process for current illegal farm workers in the country. Uh, title II would make certain changes to the H-2A program. And then Title III of the bill contains the E-Verify provisions, which make that electronic employment verification system mandatory for everyone in agriculture. So diving in a little deeper to what is in each of these titles, Title I, again, is the legalization uh, process. So it creates a program where current farm workers who are in the country in undocumented or illegal work status can get legal status to be employed. Um, it's a very minor uh, bar to qualify. If a worker claims that they have worked in agriculture for at least 180 days in the past two years, they qualify, assuming they have no other um, disqualifying condition or element in their past, such as they're a wanted fugitive, uh, a felon, or something like that. Um, assuming that's not the case, they are eligible and then would be granted legal status as a certified agricultural worker. That protects them from deportation. Uh, the employer who employs them is protected from legal action for employing a formerly illegal worker. And they can continue to be employed um, in the US economy. They get this certified ag worker status. It's good for up to five and a half years, at which point it is renewable. Uh, the one condition in the bill is that in order to renew your certified ag worker status, you are supposed to work 100 days in agriculture each year. In addition, the bill provides a pathway to citizenship for those farm workers. Um, if they can demonstrate 10 years of agricultural work, they are eligible for a green card in just four years as a certified ag worker. So if they uh, apply, obtain certified ag worker status, if they've got 10 years of work experience, then in as little as four years, they can obtain a green card. If they have fewer than 10 years of work at the time they get certified ag worker status, then they're um, 
they can't get a green card until eight years. So they have to wait twice as long. Title II of the bill contains uh, several proposed changes to the H-2A program. Uh, the bill would create an online portal for uh, employers, attorneys, agents who are filing paperwork to file all of that paperwork through one single um, online portal as opposed to filing separately through uh, separate means at the Department of Labor and Homeland Security, etc. On the wage front, uh, it would make a slight change to the current adverse effect wage rate. It freezes the AWER for one year. Uh, so beginning in 2022, the adverse effect wage rate would be the same as it is in 2021. It makes a few additional changes regarding to the classification of work in particular occupations. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated um, element of the bill, but in, in just broad terms, it freezes the wages for one year. After that one year, it then limits any annual increase to inflation capped at between 3.25 and 4.25%. Again, there's a bit of a complicated formula here, it depends upon the minimum wage in the state and what the AWER is, but the bottom line is there's a limit on the annual increase uh, between three and a quarter and four and a quarter percent. The bill, however, does not uh, do anything to address state prevailing wages or other sources uh, that, depending upon the state in which you live, uh, may be even a, a larger concern than the annual increases in the AWER. A few other changes that it proposes to the H-2A program um, include housing. Uh, while the bill does not provide any direct assistance to farmers, to address the high cost of providing housing. The bill does provide assistance to farm workers uh, to pay rent. Of course, if you employ H-2A workers, uh, your farm workers don't pay rent, so that, that benefit doesn't help an H-2A employer or his workforce or her workforce. Um, there's also a significant amount of financial assistance and additional regulation and um, advisory groups uh, related to unions and advocacy groups and nonprofits that are involved in providing housing. Uh, on the year round uh, agricultural producer front, the bill would make a change and set aside 20,000 visas per year for agricultural producers that have a year round need. Uh, of that 20,000, half of them are reserved for uh, dairy producers. And last but not least, um, on the H-2A front, this bill would make some pretty dramatic changes in the legal landscape um, and significantly increase the legal liability of farmers. Uh, the bill provides a private right of action that would allow H-2A workers to sue farmers in federal court. That's brand new, it's never existed before. Uh, the bill would loosen restrictions on taxpayer-funded lawyers for H-2A workers, enabling them to sue farmers for not just H-2A violations, but for any perceived employment violation. Uh, the bill also creates a new uh, registration scheme for foreign recruiters that imposes uh, pretty dramatic liability on farmers who could be held liable for um, activities that occur in foreign countries. Um, also authorizes class action lawsuits, uh, mandatory damages uh, up to $500,000 and um, on and on. So the, the proposed legal changes that this bill would um, create are, are pretty dramatic and, and troubling as we'll discuss um, a little bit later. Finally, the third part of the bill uh, concerns E-Verify, the Federal Employment Authorization Program. Um, E-Verify, many people, and in, in particularly in the Southeast, several states mandate uh, that employers participate in E-Verify, but on the federal level, it is still a voluntary program. 
This bill would make E-Verify mandatory, but only for agricultural employers, nobody else in the economy. Um, that would be phased in over a few years. Uh, basically, once all the farm workers who are going to adjust to legal status have had a chance to apply and adjust, E-Verify will then be phased in depending on the size of the agricultural employer um, after that time period. That's, uh, that's a wrap up of uh, what's in the bill. So I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And we, so now we just kind of want to dive into some of the, the consequences of some of the specific provisions of the bill. That's not to say that everything in this bill is bad. Uh, it's just that some of the consequences from the way that the bill is written will be devastating to certain parts of agriculture. Yeah, so let's start with the purported improvements to the H-2A program. Um, in reality, this bill provides no meaningful improvement to the H-2A program. Uh, there's no relief from the high cost of the program. Anybody who's in the program knows that's the number one problem with the H-2A program is the cost. Uh, the bill does, as I mentioned earlier, it create a one year time period where the AWER is frozen. Um, that is though effective for only one year. Um, after that, there's no relief other than this limitation on the inflation adjustment each year. And while it's certainly better than nothing to have a limit on the inflation adjustment each year, uh, again, between 3.25 and 4.25%, if you go back and look at historical H-2A data, over the last 10 years, the average annual increase is just about 3.25%. So for the next 10 years going forward, this bill will limit the increase to 3.25%. Yeah, so based, on historical data, based on historical data, that doesn't really seem to, to do much. Um, that's basically where you would be absent this provision. Um, in addition, there is no relief for farmers who, of course, in H-2A have to provide housing to their workforce. That is a dramatic cost that employers have to absorb. And depending upon where you are in the country, it's almost an impossible burden to absorb. Many areas, particularly on the West Coast, have difficulty even securing or building farm worker housing um, at any cost. Um, but certainly where those um, employers are able to provide housing, this is a significant cost concern for them. This bill provides no relief from those high costs. Uh, again, it does provide direct assistance to farm workers, but that doesn't benefit H-2A workers. The only thing you could say even potentially might possibly help is the bill authorizes USDA to provide additional funds for their farm worker housing renovation programs. But again, it doesn't provide the funding, it just provides the opportunity for Congress to later make funding available if it decides to. Um, so there really is not much on the cost front that you can say this bill is going to do to improve the current situation for farmers. In addition, um, with respect to the year-round need, this has long been a problem in the H-2A program that farms, agricultural producers with a year-round need can't access the program. This program does provide 20,000 visas uh, for employers with a year-round need. Half of those visas, however, are set aside for dairy. The other half have to go to the rest of the ag economy. Um, and again, it's something, it's 20,000 visas, but it is far, far less than the need. Uh, 20,000 wouldn't even meet the need in dairy, let alone for all the fruits, vegetables, livestock production, uh, and other areas that desperately need H-2A labor. And as we'll get into a little bit later, when you take that provision in combination with some of the other provisions in the bill, uh, you'll see just how ineffectual it really is. 
Yeah. So what what we're looking at right here with the adverse effective wage rate freeze, uh, that is just to reiterate, that is one year. Basically, you could assume that you're saving three and a half percent on your payroll. So you have one hundred thousand dollars of payroll, thirty five hundred dollars worth of savings for that one year. I think it's just important to kind of point out uh, how those savings look so we can compare them to what the some of the costs are a little bit later on. So on the cost front, uh, this slide will show you the green represents the average nationwide adverse effect wage rate over time. So you can see over the last 10 years, it has grown from just over $10 an hour to now in 2021, just over $14 an hour. You compare that to the federal minimum wage of $7.25, which has remained constant. Of course, if you live in a state that has a higher minimum wage, you certainly may be subject to a slightly higher minimum wage, certainly not $14.28. And, and I should also note that again is the average adverse effect wage rate over the country. If you live in the Pacific Northwest, you're well above $16 in 2021. So that's just the average. The bottom line on this graph shows you what the hourly equivalent minimum wage is in Mexico. Mexico's minimum wage just went up in 2021 to about $7 per day. So 88 cents is just taking $7 divided by an eight hour day the equivalent in Mexico of the minimum wage is 88 cents. That's a pretty dramatic discrepancy. Um, as is obvious, you don't even have to be an economist to see that. Um, so a, a couple of important points from that is, obviously a farm worker in Mexico is very motivated to come to the US to work, whether he or she comes legally through the H-2A program so that they can make upwards of $14 an hour or whether they come through other means and are employed by just an employer who doesn't participate in E-Verify and who's required to pay them no more than $7.25 an hour. Um, either way, they're making significantly more than they would make in Mexico. Now, the flip side of that is well, there are a lot of farm workers in Mexico who are currently working on farms and those farms are producing lots of crops. In fact, far more crops than they consume in Mexico. Those crops are being exported to the United States and they appear on the grocery store shelves right next to the products produced by American farmers who are paying, in many cases, $14.28 an hour. So this chart shows you just a pretty stark example of the number of imported food shipments into the country. This is fruits, vegetable, meat, processed food, all food being shipped into the country. Dramatic increase over the last 15 to 20 years and leading the way is Mexico, more than four and a half million food shipments into the US in 2018. This is data from FDA, which tracks um, this as uh, related to food inspections and um, uh, health and safety measures. That's this chart comes from FDA. Yeah. So Mexico, huge exporter of food into the US. On the next slide here, we can see that if you look just at fruits and vegetables and many HQA employers are fruit and vegetable growers, you look at the difference between the US production of fruits and vegetables and global production and what we export and what we import. The blue line here shows US imports of fruits and vegetables from around the globe. Over the last 30 years, pretty dramatic growth in our imports. The red bar shows you fruits and vegetables produced in the US that we are exporting. 30 years ago, we were exporting more vegetables and fruits than we imported. That's no longer true, hasn't been true uh, for more than 20 years. 
but you can see the disparity is continuing to grow year by year. The green line on the bottom shows the trend line in net trade. And you can see that by 2019, we were in the hole by $20 billion. We import $20 billion more fruits and vegetables than we export. That is a concern, uh, again, when you think about wage rates and the cost of production abroad versus the cost of production in the US. And to put just a finer point on this, here's the fruit and vegetable trade just between US and Mexico. Again, US imports, the blue bar, US exports are the red bar. Um, going back even 30 years ago, we were importing far more fruits and vegetables from Mexico than we were exporting there. Over time, our export, exports have grown. That's good news for American producers, but they've been swamped by the imports coming from Mexico. Again, the green line shows the trend. We have a $15 billion deficit just in fruits and vegetables with Mexico. And if you remember the wage disparity here, this will start to make some sense. If you can produce fruits and vegetables in Mexico and pay workers 88 cents an hour, while producers in the US are paying 1428 in the H2A program, there's quite a bit of margin there for you to pay for trucks and planes and shipping expenses to get those products into the US on the grocery store shelves. So I'll uh, leave it to all of you to figure out how two products side by side on the grocery store shelf um, can be priced even close when one comes from Mexico and the other one comes from the US. Yeah, and I, I think that that is a uh, oftentimes neglected but very important point is it, you, you look at what our farmers make, what our farmers do, but, that the reality is that everything that we do in terms of the amount it costs them to uh, grow their crop, uh, it's, it's in a globally competitive marketplace. And so I, I think it's very important to emphasize that because you see the increase in adverse effective wage rate uh, over, over the course of the last 10 years, and you, it, it's, it's substantial. It's making the cost of our own production of foods not very feasible. And with that uh, is national security concerns. That's something that I get very worried about is if it costs us too much to feed our people and we become over, overly reliant on uh, foreign gov uh, countries to feed our people, that is a, that's a big issue. And it leaves us, it's a very vulnerable and obviously vulnerable spot to those that are supplying those crops to us. Yeah, these, these trend lines make, make it clear that this is on an unsustainable path. There is no way US producers employing legal workers in the H2A program can continue to produce crops and provide food to feed America when they're facing competition from countries that are paying one fifteenth of the wage. And right. importantly, this bill does absolutely nothing about this. This right. is probably the largest threat to American agriculture. And rather than address this issue, this bill actually makes it worse. They will hasten the departure of US agricultural jobs from this country, and we will become more reliant on foreign grown food. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I, I think that uh, that leads us pretty well into our next point here, which is the, the mass amnesty portion of the bill. And just to be clear, I'm an immigration attorney. I don't, I don't have something against amnesty bills, in particular amnesty bills as it relates to agriculture. Uh, that I, I think that the the idea of rewarding someone for working in our food industry is fine. I, I have no issue with that. My, the issue comes with the consequences of giving uh, amnesty to people in the agricultural industry, which we've seen historically. Uh, the Immigration Reform Act in 1986 gave mass amnesty to farm workers. And upon gaining their legal status, they immediately left. 
and it uh, we can we can we'll look at the data in a second that that demonstrates that. Uh, but then there's there's this other side to it, which you hit on earlier, Leon, uh, which is the the twenty thousand visas that are allocated to the non seasonal jobs. So th these things are particularly concerning to me, and and this is why. So this is what happened with the SAWS program. So these these folks got their amnesty uh, in, in, in 1990, 1989, 1990. And whenever they did, you'll, you'll notice exactly what happened. Exactly what happened is exactly what we're talking about and concerned about is they immediately started leaving agriculture. Now, you don't, you don't fault the individual for this. There's a lot of opportunity out there that's not in agriculture. So it's, it's certainly not their fault. Uh, but what happened was you have these these people with a now legal working status leaving agriculture and the the uh the bill in 1986 uh actually sorry the bill in 1986 provided for provisions that would uh, basically punish employers for uh filling the void again with undocumented people but uh, it didn't actually live up to that and that's exactly what happened so you're your people with now legal working status left agriculture and you'll notice that the unauthorized aliens were the ones that filled that void so whenever you provide a mass amnesty bill in agriculture you can expect the consequence being needing undocumented people to fill the void once it's gone because there's only 20,000 available visas to fill this massive void that would be left as a consequence of the amnesty. And which kind of leads us into our next point, which is that the mandatory E-Verify requirement makes this even more difficult and more concerning to me. So let, let's kind of go back through what we have here. We have a mass amnesty bill that will, it's not a matter of if, it's a undeniable matter of will lead to mass exodus from agriculture from people that are there, especially because a lot of times that we have an aging uh, demographic that are actually serving that, uh, serving agricultural producers. So these people will leave. You can't fill the void again with undocumented people because of this mandatory E-Verify requirement. That's something uh, that there wasn't in the last bill that actually allowed them to, fit, to fill this, not, not legally, but they did fill it with undocumented people. And then, so the only outlet at this point is the 20,000 visas that we were talking about for these non-seasonal ag jobs. So you're talking about all the dairies, all the pork producers, all the, uh, all the layer house support positions, broiler house support positions, uh, all, the, all the cattle operations. They're basically, they're fighting over 10,000 visas, 10,000 are going to the dairy. So what we have as a consequence of that is a huge labor shortage in agriculture. And uh, w by the way, the consequences for failing to abide by the provisions in this bill are, are severe. So it's you, you as, a, as a farmer, particularly if, you're, uh, if your labor force is made up of people that are in a non-seasonal or temporary position, you're, now, now you're stuck in between, okay, do I, do I not abide by the provisions in this bill or do I not fill that position? That's, that's a pretty terrible place to put them. And that's, uh, that, I would say that's my single biggest concern for the agricultural industry as a whole. Because then you, you put people in those positions, then I think that what we see is what we were talking about beforehand, which was our agriculture then going even more outside of our country and becoming even more of a national security concern. So those are some uh, particularly concerning points there. Yeah, I would just add to that, Kyle, that you know we can't emphasize enough how serious this E-Verify requirement is for agriculture. The problem with the IRCA reforms in 1986 was the requirement that you no longer hire illegal workers had no teeth. It's the standard that we have today. You simply 
have to verify that the employee has valid documentation. Well, no employer is a document expert. And in fact, many employers are sued every year by the federal government for going beyond and trying to verify that documents are legitimate. So all you have to do is look at the document and see if it looks good on its face, you're hired. Well, that was the, that was the intentionally or not the Achilles heel of the last program. Mm -hmm. So fraudulent documents are rampant in agriculture and throughout the economy. People were able to effectively hire enough workers because people flooded over the border to come fill these jobs. That will not be possible if this bill becomes law. Everybody in agriculture has to use E-Verify. And all the workers that you had are going to be somewhere else in the economy. Frankly, even workers who get certified ag worker status. Yes. They, they could, they're supposed to stay working in agriculture and only supposed to work in agriculture, but nothing would prevent them from going to work anywhere else for any other employer who doesn't have to e-verify them and find that they're only limited to agriculture work. So this bill sets up a really a disaster uh, in the making, not too far down the road. When your current workforce leaves, you aren't able to access additional workers through the year round um, visas in the H-2A program. And if you're not a seasonal employer, you're just out of luck. Yeah, yeah. And we're talking about hundreds of thousands. The difference between available visas and number of positions that are gonna be needed is hundreds of thousands. Yeah. That will make that one of, if not the most competitive visa in, in, the, in the whole immigration system. It's outrageous. And, and, and another good thing that, uh, that you pointed out, Leon, uh, is the, the difference. You know, the 1986 bill, it, it imposed penalties for knowingly hiring undocumented people. That is a extremely high burden to put on the government to prove against you as the employer versus now this objective, did you E-verify, did you not E-verify? That's, right. it, it takes it from a subjective element to an objective element, which is uh, much, much easier to prove for the government. And which is, so it's, uh, it's frightening. So uh, number four on, on the list here, which I alluded to at the beginning, is the increased litigation that employers are going to be subjected to under this bill. It is no exaggeration to say this bill is a plaintiff lawyer's dream. There are more ways to sue an employer under this bill than you can even count. Um, the private right of action has long been sought by trial lawyers and advocacy groups in the H-2A program because it is so powerful. You, it, it costs you a few hundred dollars to go down to the courthouse and file a federal lawsuit. So that's all that the worker is out. The worker rarely even pays for that because they're gonna find a pro bono lawyer, an advocacy group lawyer uh, to foot the bill for that, or even a taxpayer funded lawyer. Your cost as an employer to, def to defend that lawsuit is going to run into the tens of thousands of dollars. And even if you are completely innocent and get your day in court to prove that these allegations are false and you win your case, you still lose because it is exceedingly expensive to defend litigation in federal court. Ask any employer who's ever been sued. It does not matter whether there's any merit to the claims, simply defending the case can result in financial ruin. And trial lawyers know this, and that's why they like to file these suits or even threaten to file the suits because most every employer has no choice but to settle, whether the allegations are valid or not. This bill provides lots of ways for lawyers to sue employers that do not currently exist, including applying the Migrant and Seasonal Agriculture Worker Protection Act to H-2A workers who have always been exempted from that law because 
there are a whole set of additional legal requirements, statutes, and regulations that apply to H-2A workers and their employment, and then that's governed by the Department of Labor. In addition, the Department of Labor under this bill would get brand new authority to sue employers in the H-2A program. So not only would you have audits by Department of Labor investigators where they can assess back wages and penalties, they can also file a federal lawsuit against you. They can also seek damages on top of any back wages that you would have to pay um, and any civil money penalties. That is not uh, permitted in any other area of the law. No place else can the Department of Labor hit you for back wages, penalties, and damages. But under this bill, they would be able to do that. Uh, creates new complaint systems at the Department of Labor to handle incoming complaints, process them, refer them to other federal agencies who can initiate litigation against you. The bill authorizes an entire new registration scheme for foreign recruiters that makes the farmer liable for actions that you may have no idea even occurred in a foreign country. You can be hauled into court and sued. Uh, the lawyers can represent these clients in these foreign countries who may have never even come to the US, but who allege your recruiter falsely promised them something. Uh, class action lawsuits are authorized. Mandatory damages up to $500,000 are authorized by this bill. You would have to pay the workers' attorney's fees and their costs. Uh, it goes on and on. And Kyle and I would have to, you know, hire an army of associates and lawyers to work with us just to handle the litigation uh, facing our clients. And it, it would be a boon for lawyers uh, on the plaintiff side and, and for defense lawyers for a period of time, of course, until all the farms go bankrupt because right. they can't afford paying lawyers. Uh, this is not productive. This is not helpful. This does nothing to address the serious agriculture workforce problems that we face. This bill is going to make it worse. Make no mistake about it. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. It, yeah, reading that particular section was, it was frightening. The, the consequences of it are enormous. Uh, our, our fifth point here is that the bill arbitrarily excludes construction occupations from H2A certification. Uh, right now, Construction companies that build livestock confinements, for example, uh, are able to get certification under the H2A program. Uh, the, on the 2019 bill, there was an exclusion specific for farmers, and this one there there is it. Uh, this so that and the the problem here is there's a lot of there's a lot of jobs, a lot of American jobs that rely on these H2A workers being able to get up here and being able to perform this type of construction. You know, you've got you've got everyone from supervisors to estimators to uh, bookkeepers, accountants, lawyers. At, at, there's a ton of, of high-paid American jobs that rely specifically on uh, H-2A agricultural construction companies. That they there's thousands of them that come up every year. And so, what 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 would this do? What, so this would do a few things. It would force these companies, if they're still going to perform this type of work, they have two options. They can eat because Americans are not taking these jobs. Uh, I have, we have, I have personally advertised thousands of these jobs and very rarely do I get Americans to take them. Uh, so they have two options. They can hire undocumented workers, which if you're a farmer, you can't uh, because you're required to use E-Verify. Uh, or you can rely on the H2B program. Well, much like the 20,000 visas allocated for non-seasonal uh, agricultural work, there's a, an H2B cap of 66,000 visas. Uh, and you know, I, I, for one, find caps on temporary or seasonal visas arbitrary to begin with because you're required in the application process to actually test the labor market to see if you can satisfy those positions with uh, the American workforce, but you, you can't. So the, the H2B program has a similar cap. And the, the number of available visas on April 1st start dates, which is what all these would be, uh, would there's 33,000 of them available. And every year, 
more than three times that beneficiaries actually apply for it. So it's an extremely competitive program. These people would be applying for these positions or applying for these uh, positions to sponsor H2B workers, not getting them. Uh, and that would make it to where, okay, so how am I going to build my livestock confinement in this case? Well, uh, companies that currently utilize undocumented workers love this. It takes away their, their only competition, which is H2A companies, companies that are willing to go through the burden of applying H2A visas and, and uh, abiding by the regulations and following proper procedure uh, versus the, undocu the companies that rely on an undocumented workforce. So it, it would be a windfall for them. Uh, and that's, that's about it. So now if I'm an agricultural producer, my, the, the competition for my barn just got demolished. And I'm a, so now, now guess what? The price of my barn's going up. So the price of my barn's going up. My labor force has all been legalized and is leaving. I can't refill those positions anyways. What am I to do? I mean, there's, there, there is, the combination of these things is just disastrous. And it, it's disastrous to a, to a lot of agriculture, uh, but agriculture in the mid, in the Midwest would be absolutely devastated. Uh, the, all the agriculture in the Midwest, you're talking about. Uh, a, there's a lot of dairies, a, a lot of uh, swine facilities, a lot of poultry facilities, and then all the farming is corn and soybeans, which is used to feed the animals in those confinements. So if those confinements leave, then what do you have? You've got a bunch of of land and people leaving agriculture, we're not going to get people back in agriculture, and that, that's that's frightening to me. So, and and this 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 exclusion of construction occupations was thrown in in a single provision in the middle of the bill. Uh, and, and they the the way that the bill reads, it's that you could read through it and be like, that doesn't matter, but the implications of it are absolutely enormous to agriculture as a whole. So, um, yeah, that is, you know, just to kind of summarize some of the devastating effects of the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, uh, it, any of the elements alone would make it easy enough to reject the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. But, but what's really important is to understand the consequences of these different elements in conjunction with one another and the implications that they will have on farmers. Uh, it's going to ultimately lead to increased costs for farmers and for consumers. Uh, many of the people that we rely on now will leave the agricultural industry and they won't return. And then uh, Americans will be increasingly relying on foreign sources for our food supply, which as we've talked about, that is a serious national uh, security concern. Whenever you have to rely on a foreign government to feed your people, uh, it would be easy for them to turn off that faucet. That's, that's, that's frightening. So uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about some things that, uh, that you can do about it. If you're, if you're in this situation and you're understanding the implications of this bill and you're, you're wondering what can I do to, to voice my opposition to this bill, uh, you know, for, first and foremost, share this webinar because what's important here is, is people understanding the consequences of this bill. Uh, it, it is, I, I, you know, even, even as a lawyer, if I weren't in the agricultural industry specifically, if I read through that bill, I wouldn't necessarily, none of this would necessarily jump out at me. If I didn't know uh, that the struggles of dairy farmers, of, of uh, that, you know, the, the, the struggles of folks that own swine facilities, and, uh, and if I, if I didn't understand all of this and the implications, uh, it, it would have been hard to know. So the important thing is to educate people and a good way to do that is just uh, share this webinar. Uh, so, and then also you can, you can voice your opposition to any uh, associations that you're a part of. And, and as Leon mentioned earlier that the house expected to vote on this this week. So the sooner the better to reach out to your representatives and sen senators to tell them that you want meaningful H2A reform. And that's, that's not what we're getting here. So, uh, and to, to actually help with that, uh, we're gonna be emailing out a, a template letter that you can use whenever you can contact your representatives and senators and links to how you can, how you can get to those people. Uh, 
Um, if you are looking at getting in contact with, with me or with Leon, uh, our, our contact information is on here. And we'll, we'll also email out these, these slides with that other information. You got anything else, Leon? I think that's it. Um, thanks, Kyle. Appreciate the invite and the ability to participate. And I think if folks have questions and, um, you know, they can send those in and maybe we'll do some, some additional webinars in the future. We could drill down on some of these specific uh, topics. I expect we're going to, we're going to have quite a few good questions uh, after this. So yes. Again, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And so all the, all the questions and all the comments that uh, y'all have put in the chat throughout the, the webinar, we are collecting those uh, to then do a future webinar on specifically on those questions. It would have just been uh, for, for time purposes, we wouldn't have time to get to all those questions and comments right now. So th thank you for participating. Uh, thank you, Leon. It, um, it's, it's been good. I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you.